but I think I'm going to start talking while people are looking for seats. Um, for those of you way in the back, uh, it looks like the comfy seats are pretty much taken in the front. Uh, there might be one or two uh, left, though. Um, we do have an overflow room upstairs in room 280 where this event will be live streamed. So if it comes to that and we can't fit everybody in here, um, you can go upstairs and watch everything uh, live streamed. Um, so um, did I tell you who I was yet? Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm Joel Rast. I'm the director of the uh, Urban Studies program here at, um, at UWM. Um, thank you all for coming to our event this evening. It's great to see so many people here. Um, I want to start, I'm not going to talk very long, don't worry, um, but I do want to thank our co-sponsors. We have a number of units here on campus who helped us pay for this event, and it, it's not cheap to put something like this on. Um, so um, our co-sponsors, Cultures and Communities Program, Institute of World Affairs, the Buildings, Landscapes, Cultures Program, uh, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, uh, the Center for Economic Development, and the College of Letters and Science. Thank you to all of you for helping us uh, pay for this, and, and uh, as well as in other ways. Um, I also like to, to thank a few people at uh, Urban Studies who really did put a lot of time into organizing this event. Uh, Jamie Harris, uh, Carrie Baranek, and Gonzalo Borges in particular. Um, have been working very hard over the past month or so to um, put this all together for you guys. So um, every year uh, we do this, we host this event, the Henry Meyer State of Milwaukee Summit, uh, focusing on some theme that's of importance to the, uh, uh, the city of Milwaukee and the Milwaukee region. Um, the theme of the summit this year is immigration and the city in the Trump era. Uh, it's a topic that when we thought of it last summer, we thought it was pretty timely, uh, although I don't think we quite realized how timely it, it would be by this point, uh, given the, uh, the recent midterm elections and the, uh, uh, and the focus on immigration uh, leading up to that. Um, so we've invited a, a number of speakers to reflect on this topic, uh, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, what sorts of challenges are immigrants facing now, nearly two years into the Trump presidency? And how are these uh, challenges manifesting themselves in our own city of uh, Milwaukee? Um, so before I introduce our speakers, I'm going to turn things over to our provost, uh, Johannes Britz, who will say uh, a few words before I do that. Johannes. Thank you very much, Joel. And uh, on behalf of UWM, welcome also to our panelists to a very intriguing topic. And when I saw that, I said I will be here to say the opening words because I have an accent and I'm an immigrant and I know exactly the process. And I was privileged because I came here kind of on uh, documented. They use different words to describe that. In terms of the topic, I think it's extremely relevant in the time that we live in. It's universal. It's not just in the US. If you come from Holland, South Africa, where I'm from, I was in Holland, and I see the change of people. And you know that's happening everywhere. The second thing, of course, it's a legal issue. I mean, there are many laws, many legal articulations. If you're an immigrant, even if you have a green card and you do not notify Homeland Security, I don't know if it's still the case, uh, that you change addresses, you might actually be deported. I think it's a DH-11 form that you have to fill in. There are many, many legal articulations that you need to know when you're an immigrant. Thirdly, it's a moral issue. Sometimes I think it's the difference between being different because you're an immigrant or being discriminated against because you're an immigrant. Um, the fact that sometimes they say, well, we don't discriminate because of your origin, but if you want to apply for a loan and you have an H-1B visa or whatever, you do not get the loan. So there are many differences and variants that I think sometimes it's not just a legal issue. It is really a moral issue when you deal with human beings. It is about humans, it's about people. That's the other comment I want to make. And I really think to understand to be an immigrant, whether you are here legally or not legally, I totally disagree with the notions they use, but it, we deal with people in different circumstances. 
And if you are not in their shoes, it's sometimes difficult to understand what people go through when they are immigrants coming to a different country. It's also an issue of vocabulary. I never thought of myself as an alien. But when I came to the US, I became an alien. Because in all legal documentation, you're referenced as an alien. Now, if you're a legal alien, you're lucky. So, and then how they describe people coming from different countries. Again, I say it's not just in the US, it is an international ex experience. And then I think, Joe, this is just the space at a university with a panelist where we can really have a creative environment, but also a very serious environment to discuss a notion that affects the life of many, many people and also address our own moral conscious of how we think politically about what is happening here in Milwaukee and in the US. So thank you very much for arranging this, for a great topic, very uh, relevant to what we are going through. And I wish you all uh, and our panelists a wonderful evening. Thank you very much and welcome again. Thanks, Johannes, for that. Um, I'm supposed to mention once again that we have an overflow room upstairs for anybody who came in uh, in the last few minutes. Uh, it's room 280 upstairs, and uh, we have a, a, a projector that will be live streaming the event up there if you can't fit in here or if, or if you don't want to stand in the back. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our, our panelists. I'm going to give kind of brief... Uh, uh, bios here of our panelists, uh, but I invite you to look at your programs for more detailed information uh, about our speakers. Um, Rachel Buff is a professor of history at UWM. She's an immigration historian. She's the author of Against the Deportation Terror, Organizing for Immigrant Rights in the 20th Century. Uh, the book tells the story of the American Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born and their fight for immigrant rights from the uh, 1930s to the 1980s. Uh, Mary Flynn works with the Refugee Resettlement Services Program operated by the Lutheran Social Services of Wisconsin and Upper Michigan. Uh, she coordinates refugee resettlement operations and oversees various other agency activities there. Uh, Janan Najib is a founding member and current president of the Milwaukee Muslim Women's uh, Coalition. She also directs the Islamic Resource Center uh, on the south side of Milwaukee and is the founder of the uh, uh, Milwaukee Muslim Film Festival, which is one of the only Muslim film festivals in the country. Uh, we have one substitution in the program, uh, Christ Christine Newman Ortiz is not able to join us tonight. She had to race off to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, for an event there at the last minute. So joining uh, us in her place is Jasmine Gonzalez, uh, who is the communications coordinator with Voces de la Frontera. Uh, so we thank you, Jasmine, for stepping in at the last minute. Um, finally, Karen Rotker <coughs> is a senior staff attorney for the ACLU of Wisconsin. Uh, she directs its Poverty, Race, and Civil, Civil Liberties Project. Uh, in addition to immigrant rights, she works on such issues as transportation and environmental justice, voting rights, uh, fair housing, and police misconduct. So I'm going to turn things over to our first speaker in just a moment. But before I do that, I just want to say a word about the question and answer uh, session at the end. So when you sat down, you should have found a, a note card and a, a pencil on your chair. Um, and what we'd like you to do is, if you have a question, to jot down your question on that note card um, and then pass them to the aisles. Uh, and somebody will come along at around 6.25, 6.30 and collect those cards. And I will read off the questions um, to, the, uh, to the panelists. We're doing it that way mainly to try to fit in as, as many questions uh, as we can. And we thought that might be a, a more efficient way of doing it. So I'm going to ask the presenters to keep their um, remarks to 12 minutes or less, um, to try to keep as much time, reserve as much time at the end for your questions. Um, <clears throat> with that, please welcome our first panelist, uh, Rachel Buff.
All right. Um, well, I'm so honored to see so many of my favorite people in the city here. Thank you for coming out on a chilly night. I've been asked to confine my re remarks to the past. I have a lot to say about the present, but I'm trying. OK. History is what hurts. In times of crisis, we look to the past to examine its lessons for how we might go forward. And what we find is a deep history of various protracted freedom struggles and various protracted responses to limit these freedom struggles. Tonight, I'll be focusing on immigration enforcement. And I want to start with the fugitive slave law passed in the late 18th and 19th century to limit the mobility of African Americans, to insist that constabulary in northern cities cooperate with slave catchers, to make vulnerable any black person in a northern city, regardless of the conditions of their birth, whether they were an escaped slave or freeborn, to render them vulnerable to slave enslavement. Responding to this, abolitionists, black and white, evolved a practice of accompaniment and sanctuary, meant to accompany these folks into court, meant to hide them from their vulnerability. There are obvious parallels to our current moment. Legal, critical legal scholar Mari Matsuda, the granddaughter of the undocumented writer Paul Kochi writes, the pattern of our arrival coinciding with violence against African Americans is perhaps not coincidental. For immigration is stimulated by international instability and domestic economic change, both creating status anxiety that easily erupts into violence. Act one, birthright citizenship. African Americans in this country agitated for freedom before, during, and, af during and after slavery, before and after the Civil War. They were aware during and after the Civil War that emancipation would not be enough and that there had to be an enduring, powerful protection for black citizenship subsequent to emancipation. This is a picture of the colored conventions which convened in northern cities during this period. The 14th Amendment, passed 10 years after emancipation because it was controversial, says this in section one. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of its laws. Radical words for the time. These are tested in 1898, when a Chinese-American man named Wong Kim Ark, who was born in California and educated as was very common for the time back in China, decides to come back to the United States. It's after 1888 when the Chinese Exclusion Act has passed, and he's told at Angel Island that he cannot enter because he's Chinese, and he says, oh no, I'm American. This case eventually goes to the Supreme Court, which wrestles at, for a long time nine white men, because nobody meant for the 14th Amendment to mean that there could be such a thing as an Asian American. However, Wong Kim Ark wins his case. It's important that the 14th Amendment says this, that there's an exception for one, foreign diplomats, or two, the child born to parents who are nationals of an enemy nation that is engaged in a hostile occupation of the country's territory. These are the only exceptions. During the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II, the attempt to strip Japanese, American born Japanese of their citizenship went all the way to the Supreme Court, which affirmed that even though they were nationals of a country, you know, they were eth ethnically descended from a country with whom we were at war, their citizenship was intact. Obvious current applications. Act two, learning from the banana. Around the time Wong Kim Ark was suing for his citizenship, the United States, having finished uh, dispossessing the indigenous inhabitants of the continental United States um, and prevailing over them by, by law and warfare, began to expand its territories abroad. Initially to the Philippines, Guam, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico, we acquired territories and we began to occupy territories through economic practices 
The greatest example of these to me is United Fruit, which began to have plantations in Central America and the Caribbean. The term Banana Republic was initially used to describe the nation of Honduras, where many plantations like the one pictured here existed. It is important to say that the occupants of these plantations and the occupants of the newly acquired territories of the US did not have full citizenship rights. So it was possible for Americans to eat bananas from all over the world, to travel on the Great White Fleet, I'm not making that up, on the Great White Fleet all over the world to view the tropical places where bananas were grown, but it was not possible for people from those tropical plantations to flee to better their lives, or they weren't allowed by law. Act three, refugees. People move. It's an act of migrant refusal. So for example, the Haitians in United States-backed authoritarian regimes of, under Papa Doc and Baby Doc Duvalier began leaving Haiti in 1963 and pushing to be seen as refugees in this country. Now, typically we tend to see refugees as people who are leaving only countries that we are unfriendly to. It's also very important to see this as a post-civil rights moment. So the Haitian refugee crisis, 1963 to about 1980, or you know, continuously, if you want, since then. At the same time that black citizens are pressing for their civil rights, Haitians are press pressing for refugee rights and early on achieve some traction, but the move to strip Haitians of their rights is a post-civil rights move. It's a pushback against civil rights. So we have the advent of mass detention starting around the Haitians. This is Chrome Avenue Detention Center, which starts as a response to Haitian migration in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and is still open today as a way to detain people who are petitioning for their rights as refugees to claim asylum. At the same time, in the 1980s, Central Americans from Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, um, and other countries are leaving their countries because of the instability caused by, by then, almost you know, 80 or 90 years of US occupation, support for authoritarian governments, and then the dirty wars which were fought in the 70s and 80s. A dirty war is a war fought by military or security personnel against an insurgency which incurs very high civilian casualties because very often the military and security personnel suspect everyone of being insurgency. So hundreds of thousands of people flee Central America heading north in the 1980s, uh, 1970s and 80s. Almost none of them are granted refugee status. They're seen as economic migrants. So in the 1980s, in, it starts in the churches, a notion of sanctuary, which harkens back in some ways to the abolitionists with whom I began. But the idea that churches should use their space to offer sanctuary to those fleeing repression, danger, and death in Central America who are, who are continually not acknowledged by the regime here as people deserving of refuge and shelter. The sanctuary movement in, of the 1980s gains traction in churches, temples, and mosques, cities and states, it becomes a fairly widespread movement. The pushback is in the slide on your right. Um, so in the early 1990s, Republican politicians start to link sanctuary, which is a nice word, right? If you go to church or temple or mosque, you might have a, a period of your service where you talk about sanctuary. It's a spiritual word, it's a sweet word. However, in the early 1990s, politicians began to demonize sanctuary as a place of crime, a place of danger, and to link immigration with crime and danger. So when you say sanctuary city now, um, depending on what quarters you're in, you could be, it, it can be a very controversial word. CODA, Sanctuary Campus. We exist in a time of protracted danger and vulnerability for many, many people. Our campuses are public spaces where we come together on evenings like this to share ideas, to welcome one another, to regardless of race or ethnicity or nationality. It's very clear in the current regime that these spaces are going to become more and more dangerous for foreign-born students, for transgender people, for um, people of color. 
the response that we have, the response that is given to us by history, starting with the abolition movement, continuing throughout history, is to find ways to take care of and shelter one another. Sanctuary campus is something being enacted around the country. Provisions for, and all of you who teach here, take this to heart. What would you do? What are you supposed to do if, if the Immigration Custom, Customs Enforcement Agency shows up at your classroom door with a warrant? Do you know what your rights are? Do you know if you have to turn over a student? Sanctuary Campus would say, we're going to give you trainings. We're going to give you people to, to send that ICE, those ICE people to. We need something in effect on our campus. We have no policies for this now. Um, and we need one. OK, 12 minutes under 50 years. How, how am I doing in time? OK, all right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, our next speaker is going to be Mary Flynn from Lutheran Social Services of Wisconsin and what's the, what's the rest of the title? Upper Michigan. Upper Michigan. I'm definitely going to need a timekeeper, so keep me going here. Good evening, good evening everyone. Um, oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, I have been with Lutheran Social Services for uh, almost 27 years now, and about uh, nine years ago, they offered me another opportunity that I didn't necessarily choose. So I ended up in Milwaukee, coming from Green Bay, and joined um, the ranks of refugee resettlement. I knew nothing about it. The first four months were extremely difficult because I didn't know what I was doing. And so tonight I'd like to just offer you an overview of refugee resettlement so that I can kind of give you, for some of you, a review that um, know about this, but for others, so that you understand what the uh, daily foundation in our office is. Because it's, knowledge is power and we're dealing with people and there's so many facts out there um, that um, may not be my facts, but I just wanted to give you a view from my office today. So this is our mission statement, act compassionately, serve humbly, and lead courageously. All of these are things that we do every single day in our office because refugees come to us having had to flee their homes under various um, circumstances, but all involving persecution, torture, violence, threats. And they didn't necessarily choose to come to the United States. But one of the things that I get to see in my office every day, or I used to, I should say, is that I used to see America in people's eyes because they were so excited to be here. And they had such great hopes and dreams for the United States. These days, since uh, January 27th, 2017, at 4.30 in the afternoon, that all changed with the first executive order, which affected the admission of refugees into the United States. I now see something quite different. I see people who are fearful, who need reassurance that they have permanent legal status that they arrived with, and they need reassurances that what they see on TV isn't um, necessarily facts that they have to pay attention to. So we have to temper a lot of that. LSS Refugee is part of the piece of the pie of these tremendous supportive services that Milwaukee is fortunate to have. We work in, with refugees, and we also work with asylees only after they're adjudicated for permanent legal status in the United States. We're very fortunate to have other panelists tonight that can speak to the other pieces of the pie, which include people seeking asylum, DACA, undocumented people, and, um, and that sphere of services. We deal with refugees, um, and that's a very specific um, service area. So this is my elevator speech. Refugee resettlement is our democratic expression, or the international expression of the democracy that we espouse here in the United States, or that we want other people to believe that we have on a daily basis. It's a humanitarian effort between the United Nations and the United States, and that's such an important thing for me. Refugees are not immigrants, but these days are often included in that discussion. Refugees come through an organized process through the Department of State. They land with permanent legal documented status. So when people say, oh, well, they're immigrants, they're technically not. However, the United States does allow over one million immigrants into the United States every year, not only refugees, which account only for a very 
small portion of that, but also people that come under various visas, asylees, and other means. So to make it very simplistic, people flee their country and they present themselves to a United Nations office. They go through a rigorous interview process. And if they're lucky, they get refugee status. And if they're very lucky, because there's 55 million registered refugees in the world, only 22,410 came to the United States last year. Compare that to the 55 million who are waiting. Very small portion. Um, and if they're very fortunate, they might have somebody who's already here that they know, and that person may live in Milwaukee. And so through this very complex, sophisticated process, they're able to connect people to Milwaukee. Who has a resettlement agency in Milwaukee? At the beginning of 2018, there were three, Lutheran Social Services, International Institute of Wisconsin, and Catholic Charities. Catholic Charities decided to um, exit the refugee resettlement program this past July. So International Institute and LSS are one of the two agencies, and that case may be assigned to us. Extremely simplistic view. Um, but. That's kind of the, the pathway. The current administration um, ordered the first executive order in 2017. People kept going to court. After the third time, we're walking around my office saying, please don't go to court, because every time you do, the 120-day hold on refugees began anew. And it was very difficult for us to watch that. But the presidential determination is put out the first week of October every year, and this year it was 30,000. Considering that we got 22,410 in 2018, we now know what a 30,000 year looks like. Brief trends, though, in February or in fiscal year 2016, 85,000 were admitted. That was the goal. It wasn't like we'll only let in 85,000. It's we're going to let in 85,000 and maybe more. In 2017, President Obama's administration decided to have 85,000 plus another 25,000 for Syrians final total of 110,000. Of course, the election came, the executive order came out in 2017, and the, the arrivals have been greatly reduced. This year, it's 30,000. 1979, 200,000 refugees were admitted to the United States. We can do better, and we have capacity to do better. So it's really important to know that refugees arrive with full permanent legal documented status for the rest of their lives, as long as they're law abiding, um, and th if there's one slide tonight, this is the one that I want you to take home with you. Full permanent legal document status from the time they're admitted to the United States for the rest of their lives. They have to abide by the same rules and regulations and expectations that you and I do. The goal of refugee resettlement is self-sufficiency. The government wants them to get a job, pay taxes, become citizens, possibly become homeowners, but just enjoy the opportunity that that we all enjoy here in the United States. So it is self-sufficiency. I love this picture because this came from one of my staff. He took this picture, but look at the hopes and dreams that people have for the United States. This is a camp, and they put up a White House plaque. This is where they aspired to go to. I asked my staff what happened to these people. He said, I don't know. I took the picture, and I left. So we don't know what happened to them, but I think that that spirit just lives on. This is the Kakuma camp in um, Kenya. 350,000 people live here. This is Palmyra, Syria, sometime in 2014 or 2015. Take a look at those escalators. Very Western style mall. This was it in December of 2016 after the destruction. Same elevators, same mall. But despite all of that, we know where people are coming from. We also know that our job is to greet people at the airport and let them know that they're in the United States now and that they can begin to really have hope and that they can begin to heal from the trauma that they've experienced. I want you to know that these are the services that refugee resettlement agencies provide because it's important for you to know what we do. We greet people at the airport. We get them connected. We enroll the kids in school. We do sign them up for eligible benefits until they can get on their, um, on their feet. We provide case management more intensively for the first year, and then after a while, they might not need us anymore, which is great. They're growing out of our services. We do provide information and referral for up to five years, because at five years, they're eligible for citizenship, and we provide them with citizenship assistance after that. 
We also help people get a job, and Milwaukee is really unique in that. This are three graduates from a single family who arrived um, in Madison, Wisconsin, where we have an office. They all wanted to um, they wanted to to be involved in the uh, experiences and the jobs that they had in in Iraq, but they weren't able to. Uh, they didn't have the education, so they all started at Madison College in Wisconsin. And this picture is from May of 2018. All three of them in one day in Madison. Very proud day, not only for them, but for all of those who knew them as well. This is one of my staff. He came to the United States from Kakuma Camp, 17 years old, 10 words of English. At the age of 22, he graduated valedictorian of Division High School here in Milwaukee. Five years later, graduated summa from Marquette. I wanted to have Thanksgiving dinner at my, or a get together at my house. Uh, for a holiday dinner, and he said, you know, what, what, what will you bring, and what are you going to bring from Somalia? And he went, you know, people always want to have refugees bring refugee food. And he said, I've never had a turkey dinner in my life. I've never had a Thanksgiving dinner. So um, we decided to have a Thanksgiving dinner at my house, and then my daughter got the bright idea to have him make it. So he did a Martha Stewart thing. We rolled up the napkins, put a little bowl on them and things. But he made this dinner completely by himself from scratch. Everything was from scratch. And he was so proud of this turkey. His mother passed away before they came to the United States. His father chose not to come and stay with other family members. He essentially came on his own. And three months after this picture was taken, he got married. For the first time in his life, he had a bed of his own. For 29 years, he had slept on chairs or floors until he could have a place of his own. So the turkey took six hours to make, but that picture and that smile, we just love this in our office because uh, it was a long road for him to get to this point. This is where he lived. Got there when he was three, left there when he was 17. For you to understand refugee resettlement means that you need to have a resource that you you know can go to. So we welcome your calls, we welcome your emails at any time because I think it's important that you have a resource that is able to offer you information about refugee resettlement. Even a brief question, we're happy to answer it. You're welcome to come and stop by and visit our office. We have ESL classes at 9.30 um, Tuesday through Friday. It's a really vibrant office. I've got some really wonderful staff, but just to step foot in a resettlement office um, and see what's going on in there is a wonderful thing. And then um, our employment workshops are always interesting, teaching people how to work in the United States, how to be on time. We close the workshop door at um, 1035. The workshop starts at 1030. And the door closes at 1035 because an employer will not allow you to be late. So we have to kind of acculturate them to that as well. And it's not always a good feeling, but it's an important thing that we teach people how to do. And uh, if, if a couple people come in and you call us in advance, we'll even have lunch for you too. Maybe not turkey, but we'll have some of those noodles for you. Okay. Once again, they share a lot of hopes and dreams, and you would not believe my staff on Monday morning at a staff meeting after a Packer game. <laughs> they know more about football than I ever care to, actually, but they're fighting back and forth. Hey, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. It was, it's really pretty funny. I am trying to get them hooked on this, but they have no interest at all. I really do believe that refugee resettlement is our international expression of democracy, and I hope it's what you would all like to be, because it's certainly what I want to be as well. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Um, our next speaker is Nanan. Uh, sorry. is Janan Najib from the Milwaukee Muslim Women's Coalition. Do you have a PowerPoint? Do you have a PowerPoint? No, I'm, I'm just putting back the, this thing up. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank no, you. that's okay. Can we move this? Or? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. I think I'm okay. Yeah. 
Hello, good evening, and uh, thank you to UWM's Urban Studies uh, Department and all of the sponsors for putting this on and for all of you for coming out. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm like the student that kind of crams the last minute. I was supposed to have it in by yesterday at noon, and I started last night. So um, anyhow, so you just get to listen to me. Um, when I heard the title, Immigration in the City in the Trump Era, um, what I immediately thought is that what it probably should have been is America's history of exclusionary immigration policies instead. Uh, immigration policies in the Trump era is actually the logical next step to our longstanding history of discriminatory immigration policies in the US that have targeted specific uh, groups for exclusion. <clears throat> The most serious concern affecting immigrant communities and many ally communities is that we don't know our history and we think our democracy can take care of itself. If these last two years have taught us anything, it is how fragile our democracy actually is. If we leave, if we leave it to others to take care of and also how easily our fellow citizens are swayed if someone else defines us, because then we are no longer immigrants. We are illegal immigrants or illegal aliens. We are no longer Muslims. We are terrorists and jihadists. But let's take a quick look at our history of intolerance and xenophobia in our country to put today's, today's uh, uh, um, uh, scenario in perspective. Uh, Rachel talked briefly about some of the issues but many of us don't know really about the full story about intolerance and xenophobia in our country. The Native nations, the uh, Native Americans uh, in this country were the first to be basically exterminated. Many don't know that it was only a few decades ago that some of the religious practices of these Native nations were finally decriminalized. Although these were the native peoples, African slaves, I'm not going to uh, repeat what Rachel had talked about, about um, uh, uh, basically being looked at as, as inhuman and subhuman, um, but this was, this was basically the, the history within our country. And this was nothing less than racism. The Chinese Exclusion Act, it lasted for 61 years. Um, we allowed the Chinese and we welcomed them when they were here to build our railroads, but when we no longer needed them, then suddenly we didn't want them here anymore. Irish Catholics, many people don't know that the Catholics were also discriminated against. Italians and Eastern European Jews. Few know that when during the Holocaust that a ship with that, that had Jews on it was actually turned around and sent back because we didn't want these refugees here. The Japanese internment camps. Again, these were not Japanese from Japan. These were Japanese Americans. These were our colleagues. These were our friends. These were our neighbors. These were our classmates. And uh, um, we, more than 60% of them were actually American citizens, yet we interned them. And now we're dealing with Islamophobia and the anti-Latinx uh, movements. So, so basically, let's take a look again at some of the policies that we had in place. For example, in 1917, Congress began imposing a literacy test on immigrants, which led to the passing of the Immigration Act. It barred people from entering the country if they were unable to read English, if they were feeble-minded persons, quote, idiots, epileptics, anarchists, and all immigrants from Asia. The Johnson-Reed Act in 1924 was defined as necessary to preserve the ideal of American homogeneity. The Mexican rep 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 repatriation um, between 1929 and 1936, when our government deported an estimated one million Mexicans and Mexican-American people. Again, 60% were US citizens. A lot of this is also based on the ideologies of the individuals that are enforcing these types of policies. 
Some are biblical. 19th century settlers destined to expand across North America because they believed they had spe special virtues, often known as manifest destiny. Slavery, again, was justified by using cherry-picked Bible verses with slaves obeying their earthly masters. The nativists, known also as the know-nothings, that were hysterical at the hordes of morally inferior Irish Catholics that were coming into the country. There was also the ethnic inferiority. The Chinese were looked at and viewed as being the yellow peril because it was, they were considered to be ethnically inferior and were taking away American jobs. Eugenics also was, was in play. The idea of race mixing was against the law because it leads to an inferior breed. This included Indian nations, Mexicans, blacks, and the Chinese all were forbidden from marrying Caucasians. The Japanese were only allowed menial jobs and most Western states passed legislation that forbid marriage between Caucasians and Asiatics. So as we hear the new rhetoric, Muslims are terrorists, Mexicans are criminals and rapists, and Africans came from a-hole countries, while the majority of terrorist acts and mass shootings in this country are actually committed by my white men, why are we surprised? Just yesterday, the FBI released its official hate crimes report for 2017, and it said that hate crimes jumped 17% last year. This is the third year, consecutive year, of increases since 2001. The Muslim community here has been directly affected by the travel ban and family separation. Family members that have been waiting to be reunited with spouses or children fear permanent separation. My husband's family is dispersed around the world after leaving the Syrian war. All of them are professionals. Some still languish in Syria with little hope of bringing anyone here. The efforts to end birthright citizenship needs to be called what it is, a policy to prevent more black and brown people from entering this country. As minorities, we get caught up repeating, no, we're not terrorists, no, we're not criminals, no, no, no. We expend all this energy on defending ourselves rather than taking action and becoming empowered. But I really believe this changed this past election. In many places in America, people rejected candidates that promoted bigotry and hate. We need to make that in all places. The new house and many state governments will be more representative of our, of our nation's vibrant diversity. Just a few years ago, Governor, Governor Scott Walker stood on the national stage with leading Islamophobes running for president and jumped on the bandwagon and said, there are only a few decent Muslims. Well, the Muslims in this state mobilized like never before. We spent months educating folks on the process, registering them to vote, making phone calls, sending postcards, and getting them to exercise their right to say goodbye. People that have been in this country for decades and have never voted, voted for the very first time. My experience based on what I do every day is that the vast, vast majority of people are good, decent people that are incredibly uninformed, usually getting their information from the same source. I always say that if all you listen to is Fox News, you need to get out more. We need a war of information. We need to continue mobilizing people in our communities. We need to use social media, not to rant, but to share good information. We need to mobilize religious leaders. Talk of faith and justice needs to be meaningful. They have a major role in ending anti-immigrant sentiment. We need to uplift the positive values of diversity and unity, highlight the immense contributions of immigrants, highlight the immigrant dream of hope and opportunity that is what America was built on. Instead of correcting wrong information, tell affirmative stories about immigrants you know. Don't ever give up on our democracy and don't assume it's not your responsibility to protect the rights of all its people. We need to be empowered and energized by the fact 
that last week, across the country, millions and millions of Americans chose compassion over arrogance, a shared future over fear. They embraced our country's diversity as a source of strength. Let's continue to build on that. I just want to end, many of you might have heard it before, I'm not sure, but I just want to end with a few, a few uh, um, sentences from the poem Home by Warson Shire. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throat. The boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy be behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade bur burnt threats into your neck, and even then you carried the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in an airport toilet, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains beneath carriages. No one spends nights, days and nights in the stomach of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be bitten, pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire. Thank you. Thank you, Janan. Our next speaker is Jasmine uh, Gonzalez from Voces de la Frontera. No PowerPoint. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Jasmine. I am the uh, communications coordinator from Voces de la Frontera, here to fill in for Christine Newman Ortiz, our fearless leader who is currently in Washington, D.C., working her magic. Um, and I also want to mention that I am actually a proud UWM alumna. I graduated this past May uh, with a master's degree in nonprofit management. So it is super exciting to be here in front of all of you. Um, and yes, I'm absolutely uh, stalling for time right now. <laughs> um, so many of the things that Voces works for that we believe in have already been said by um, the other speakers. Um, and so I am just, you know, I want to tell you guys a little bit about who Voces de la Frontera is. I'm sure some of you have heard of us, some of you maybe haven't, but you might have seen our work um, here in Milwaukee, statewide or even nationwide. Um, VOSAS is a pro-immigrant, uh, pro-low-income worker grassroots organization. It was originally a uh, newspaper that began, um, founded by Christine um, in the 1980s. Um, she was based out of El Paso, Texas, and she was following the plight of workers at what were called maquiladoras, um, which were factories set up in these NAFTA free trade zones. Um, she eventually relocated to Wisconsin in 2001 and ended up uh, establishing VOSAs here um, as a center w to which immigrants could come and just learn their rights, take English classes, take citizenship classes, um, and just work towards that self-sufficiency that these workers and immigrants want. Um, in 2006 is when VOSAs really kind of became um, the organization that we know it to be now, it became this huge mobilizing force. Uh, in 2006, Jim Sensenbrenner introduced HR 4437, which would have made it a felony to be undocumented, but also would have criminalized anyone who did not report in an undocumented individual. Um, that's, that's just insane. I mean, that would have just, you know, criminalized so many people who were doing nothing but exist uh, in this state. Um, when that was introduced, VOSAs knew that they had to do something. It just was such an insane law. Um, and so they began to mobilize. They began to bring in 
all of these workers, immigrants, and allies and began to put pressure on legislators. They went to the Capitol, they had sit-ins and marches, and they pushed back against this horrible law. And they created a day without Latinos and immigrants, which now is a yearly movement that brings in tens of thousands of people, um, you know, to show the strength of immigrants in Wisconsin. And the Sensenbrenner bill luckily was, you know, put to rest. It did not become law. Um, at the same time, however, at the federal level, um, Congress was creating the Real ID legislation, which basically pressures states to um, ask for documentation when giving people driver's license. And by documentation, I mean proof of citizenship. Um, because Real ID means that your driver's license can be used to come into federal buildings, um, board commercial aircraft and such. You have to provide proof that you are here legally, whether as a citizen or a resident. Before that happened, before that was implemented, undocumented individuals could receive driver's licenses here in Wisconsin. And when Real ID was passed and when Act 126 was passed in Wisconsin, um, that was no longer an option. So all of these undocumented individuals who had once legally been able to drive no longer were able to. Now, that is the basis of a lot of what we're working on now, because without a driver's license, these individuals, contributing individuals, are unable to be self-sufficient. They can no longer operate a motor vehicle legally. They are barred from many forms of employment that either require you to be a driver or simply you know, require identification from you. Um, and it's instilled fear in many of these communities because they can no longer you know, contribute to the, you know, their community. They're terrified to drive. Um, and if you know, you're caught driving, you know, many of these people still have to drive, but if you're caught driving without a license, that has led to families being separated, um, breadwinners and parents being deported, leaving children you know, without their parents here. Um, and so this is something that we're actually working on now. And it's something that, you know, this started in 2006, long before Donald Trump was ever in office. Um, the way things have changed now under Trump is that all of this anti-immigrant sentiment is now clear. It is on the table. He started his campaign calling Mexicans, you know, rapists and has just debased and dehumanized these people who are good and working, you know, contributing towards society. So the only real change is that this legislation is still happening. We're still working against it. But now there's additional fear. There's additional hatred and vitriol that we have to deal with. Um, for any of the people that work with VOSAs, you know, it, they're, they're terrified. They don't know what to do. But for VOSAs de la Frontera, it has mobilized us even further because now we know exactly what we need to you know, work against. We know exactly what we're up against. Um, this past year, leading up to the midterm election, we created a program called Boceros por el Voto under our 501c4 advocacy arm, where we took all of our allies and we mobilized as many Latinx voters in the state to, you know, step up and vote for people who could fight against this kind of just horrible legislation. Um, and we had record turnouts across the state because people were calling, you know, anyone they knew and everyone they knew to register to vote. You know, people who had been citizens for years who had thought my voice doesn't matter, my vote won't count, went out because this was their like last hope like that they could do something and i mean you guys saw it we won you know tony evers is going to be governor and we have this chance to pass legislation that is far more compassionate that will return so many of these rights that were previously afforded to immigrants um and just you know let them be contributing members of society as they wish to be um and so that's kind of a lot of what we're doing now. Now that uh, the election is over, the work is just beginning. Um, we are working to hold these newly elected officials accountable because 
they have promised to work with us. And so now we need to see that kind of happening. Um, we are actually going to be holding a community forum on Saturday regarding um, legislation around restoring driver's licenses, not only to undocumented immigrants, but also to low income workers who, because of their inability to pay for fines, have had their licenses suspended. So, I mean, there are people who are unable to drive, unable to access employment for not actually related to like unsafe driving violations, but simply because of stringent laws that don't let them drive. Um, so that's what we're going to be working against. And with that, with we're hoping that that's going to go through with like this new Democratic, uh, you know, governor. And that just fixes so many other issues. I mean, everything is so interconnected. So that's kind of what we're doing. Um, and you know, we're always, we're always watching out for people. We're still doing our English classes and our citizenship classes because at the end of the day, all these people want to do is you know, reach that American dream and we're gonna be there for them no matter who's in office, so. Thank you for that, uh, Jasmine. Um, so did uh, anybody pick up these uh, uh, note cards that you guys have been busily writing questions on? Has that been done? Uh, if it hasn't been done, um, then somebody will come down the aisles, I think, uh, in the next few minutes and collect those. And uh, uh, we still have one speaker. So after she is finished, then we'll take your questions. So our last speaker is Karen Rotker from the ACLU of Wisconsin. Karen. Okay, I think we're, yeah, I don't, you don't think so. Yeah, well, whatever. Um, I don't have PowerPoint either. So thank you for having me here. Um, and I was asked to talk about litigation court-related issues. Um, but before I do that, because everyone's talking about elections, I want to give you the flip side of two things in the Wisconsin Constitution that most people don't know. In 1848, the original Wisconsin Constitution it was published in German and Norwegian, as well as in English. Because most, or a huge number, and I believe it was most, of the people who were living here at that time didn't speak English. The second thing about the first Wisconsin Constitution of 1848 was that it allowed immigrants to vote before they became citizens, if they were white. And it was very explicit, any white immigrant who has declared their intention to be a citizen. So there was a process and you would say, I'm going to become a citizen in a few years down the road. And as long as you said you wanted to do it, you and you were white, of course, you were allowed to vote and mail. Uh, so that lasted until 1908, around the time that lots of Poles and Eastern Europeans and Jews and Italians and Greeks who were at the time not considered to be white, they were considered to be of other races, started coming into this state and many other states, and then suddenly the Constitution was changed because we didn't want those people voting. So I just think that that's a good thing to have in your minds um, when you hear some of what you hear now. So I wanted to talk a little bit, not because I expect anyone to remember all these court cases, but because I think what the ACLU on a national level is litigating, and the ACLU is a national organization, shows the breadth of the attack on immigrant communities today. Um, there actually is very little, and actually no litigation currently that I'm aware of in Wisconsin, but these issues all affect people in Wisconsin, and they touch on things every speaker today has been talking about. So, for example, there was the litigation over the Muslim ban, which is, which is call it what it is, um, which unfortunately, after the third round the U.S. Supreme Court found was within presidential authority, there are now people looking, there's supposed to be a waiver process, so a few people from these countries might be allowed in, and there is some investigation going on right now by advocates to see if that waiver process actually exists at all, which is not clear. Um, there are cases before the Supreme Court right now on the right to bail in immigration detention. So again, you have this mass lockup of 
immigrants for, and this includes persons who are here legally who might have, as the uh, person who introduced us said, not registered a change of address or done some, any minor thing um, who are being deprived of bail and there is now a, a legal fight going on as to whether people should be allowed to have bail during the time that their cases are being heard. There is, as I'm sure all of you know, the litigation over family separation and detention, tearing children away from their parents and then doing it in a way where they didn't even keep track, in many cases, of which child belonged to which parent. They are still, months later, not, have not been able to reunite all these families. There were hundreds of parents who were deported without their children and deported to places where you know, there's barely phone service, much less internet. So that is an ongoing struggle and just shows how, as we all know, how horrific the, the attacks have been. There is um, the termination of what was called temporary protected status, which was a status that allowed people from communities where there had been disasters to remain in the US. Um, it was terminated in a number of countries such as El Salvador, Honduras, Haiti, and Sudan, not because those conditions had actually improved, but the court cases that are going on now are showing that there was all this internal discussion about how can we justify what we've already decided we're gonna do? Find us evidence to make it look like things are better there so we can get all these people out of those A-hole or S-hole or whatever we call, or some call countries, out of, out of the United States. I mean, that's clearly what was going on. There is litigation, this, I don't think this is an ACLU case, but nationally going on, be, for the young people who were benefits, uh, beneficiaries of President Obama's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival Program, again, giving some sort of legal status to people who were brought here as children and who were um, studying or allowed people to work in the United States, which again was terminated for no good reason other than political hostility. Um, that's also ongoing and been on hold. There is litigation going on over former Attorney General Sessions' decision to um, eliminate as allowable grounds for asylum being the victim of domestic violence or being the victim of gang violence. You still have to prove to, to show asylum that your country won't protect you, but there was pretty clearly established law that if you were a DV victim or a gang violence victim and you tried to get help from your government or were in a government that refused to protect you from those situations, that was grounds to seek asylum. And that was just sort of, again, waved away because of somebody's agenda. Um, there is, I think it might have ended in the last day or two, you probably heard about the litigation over the census citizenship question. Again, the uh, US government decided for the first time since 1950 that they were not, that they were gonna ask whether people were US citizens. And if you look at the actual question, it's worse than that. It's like, are you a citizen? Are you naturalized? If you're naturalized, what year are you naturalized on? Are you not a citizen? The clearly goal of this is to strike terror in people. People are not going to answer these questions, or they're not going to answer them truthfully, or both. And what happens if people don't answer the citizenship questions? They don't show up in the counts, so they get fewer representatives in Congress or in the legislature because they don't exist. There is less money for those communities because a lot of the funds you get from the US government are based on population. If people don't exist, then you don't have to give them you know, money. And of course, people are not gonna, whether or not the law says that citizen, or that census information can't be used by anyone else, people aren't gonna believe that. And for understandable reasons in light of what's going on right now and aren't gonna answer those questions. And at the trial this past week, which was in New York with National ACLU, there, it was very clear. I mean, they were calling the head census scientists to talk, who testified about how ridiculous this question was, how they knew it was gonna scare people off, how it wasn't their idea, and ultimately, again, how it was all part of a political agenda. So there are court cases going on as we saw, unfortunately, with, I mean, the court cases, most of these are buying time. 
But there's also a limit to how much they can do, as we saw with the Muslim ban cases, when you have a Supreme Court that has a certain perspective on things. So I also want to talk about some of the advocacy and efforts we're making locally. And I really want to emphasize, um, from the ACLU perspective, and I think from the perspective of everyone on this panel, that the litigation alone isn't enough. Advocacy and litigation can work together in education and community. So I'm here talking about you know, what the ACLU is doing. Folks are talking about what their organizations are doing. But it's really the people and the communities who are needed to, to make real change in voting, yes, and just every day. Um, right now, some of, the, some of our efforts at advocacy have included over the past year trying to get local law enforcement basically not to be part of Trump's deportation force. Um, there's a special program called 287G where local sheriffs get trained to be essentially immigration agents. Because of advocacy, uh, Milwaukee County, under the prior sheriff, had actually applied to be part of it. It was the only, as far as we know, the only community that was turned down, and it was largely turned down because there was so much opposition within the community, whatever the former sheriff wanted. Waukesha County did get 287G status, which means they've got people trained in the jail, not the officers on the streets, but they, to, you know, question people and, and potentially turn people over to ICE, which is obviously a concern for us. Um, we have did open records requests around the state, and some, some sheriffs are cooperating with ICE and some are not, and so we're going we're gonna to continue working on advocating for that. I, I want to mention, because of something Jasmine said earlier about um, Representative Sensenbrenner last decade trying to make being here in it being undocumented a crime. It's, I want folks to know that being undocumented is not a crime. The mere fact of unlawful presence is not a criminal violation. If you've re-entered, if you've done certain other things, it could become a crime. But just physically being here and not having documentation is a civil violation. So when you hear people talking about criminals, take that with a grain of salt, too. Um, we're also looking at detainer litigation. Again, people who are being held in jails and then held for extra days uh, because ICE thinks that maybe they should be held because of their immigration status. In p other parts of the country, they have actually held US citizens with um, foreign sounding names, as it were. It, these excess days on ICE holds, which is a big part of the problem. Um, we have advocacy staff in our office who are doing Know Your Rights training on immigration issues for communities around the state. Uh, we don't do, I just, I want to mention that 83 people were arrested in Wisconsin in September. Almost half had no criminal history. Um, we are continuing to do open records to try to figure out where the communities that most of these folks are coming from are so that we can target some of our education and advocacy efforts. And again, trying to continue to advocate with sheriffs and jails around the state to not necessarily ask everyone for citizenship, to not cooperate with ICE. There's no law that says they have to. And particularly for a lot of these people who are being picked up on civil violations, this is a really critical issue as well. We don't do the kind of individual immigration deportation cases because we don't have the capacity to do that. So we're looking at bigger systemic issues. And um, it, I don't have the PowerPoint, but I want to give you an email address because if you hear of people being affected by these sort of broader issues or a US citizen being detained in jail and being held by ICE or family separation or things like that in Wisconsin, you can email us at immigration at aclu-wi.org. Immigration at aclu-wi.org. Because part of how we develop the work we do is hearing from people who have heard from someone else, oh, this group cares about our civil rights. Maybe they can help us. And that's what we want to be here to do. Thank you. All right, thank you, Karen.
Um, all right, so now we have some time for questions from you guys. Uh, and uh, apparently, uh, you guys didn't like the idea of writing your questions out on these little cards very much because we didn't get very many of them. Um, so, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to read off a few that we got here, and then if we have time left, we will we'll just have people raise their hands. Um, so the uh, the first question here um, focuses on Milwaukee's status as a sanctuary city, and this person wants to know uh, about Trump's threat to cut off all federal funding for sanctuary cities, and whether or not the panelists have any thoughts on that. I mean, there's no thing in. Is this on? It should be on. Have we got the mic on is, over here? Can people hear me? Okay, I'm not hearing my own echo, so. Um, there's no such thing as a sanctuary city in law. It just, Milwaukee doesn't, you know, automatically cooperate with ICE or turn people over to ICE. They can't just strip money. In fact, they tried to do that um, to Chicago, and there was a very strongly worded opinion out of the federal conservative appeals court in Chicago that said, if those, if cooperation with ICE isn't included as a condition of the grant that you're getting or of the federal money you're getting, then non-cooperation, you can't just say, oh, if you don't cooperate, we're taking that money away from you. It doesn't work. And at this point, Milwaukee is, as far as I know, not under any threat. Well, well not under any real threat. So it should be said that there's a sanctuary ordinance that passed the Aldermanic Council two years ago mm -hmm. that's limited but important. There's a sanctuary resolution that passed MPS about not allowing um, MPS students to be detained or deported on MPS territory. And it's important to say also about sanctuary that it's an imaginative category, right? So when California becomes a sanctuary state, um, that's, that's a sort of a capacity building statement as are the threats, right? You know, it's been a very effective threat since the early 90s to say, oh, we're going to strip money from sanctuary cities, blah, blah, blah. That's actually unconstitutional, as Karen's pointing out, unless it's explicitly like, unless you're cooperating, you know, there, you can't st strip, you know, public right. transportation funding because someplace becomes a sanctuary city. These are idle threats, but really importantly, they're rhetorically incredibly powerful. So there's a fear of sanctuary, which just think about what I just said. <coughs> Fear of sanctuary, sanctuary, safety, fear of safety. It doesn't make very much sense. But however, it's been a very successful rhetorical campaign. All right. Um, the next question focuses on UWM, and um, Rachel is probably in the best position to answer this question, <laughs> I'm thinking. What is UWM doing to protect undocumented students and staff? So. Uh, <clears throat> there has been a campaign since 2016 waged largely by student activists to try and have a sanctuary campus. Um, and what that means, again, this is a capacity building category, right? So it could mean many things. It could mean saying we don't want UWM police to collaborate with ICE at all. We want all faculty and staff to be trained so we know, like, again, you need to know what kinds of warrants are needed in different kinds of space. Your classroom is different than the corner of Hartford and, and Oakland, is different than your dorm room. All of this has different jurisprudence and different laws, right? So can ICE come into your dorm room is different than can they come into your classroom is different than can they come into my office is different than can they walk in here, right? We need to, be, we need to have a widespread process of education about this on campus. We have also, so because of student activism, there was a sanctuary campus task force constituted by the chancellor last year. Um, I and some other people in this room serve on that task force. So there is some undocu ally training going on on campus. The Roberto Hernandez Center does yeoman's work in that way. But very much because of the fear spread by the word sanctuary, there has been a, a deep hesitation on the part of our administration to take actions. So, you know, and this doesn't, it, it affects undocumented students and staff. It affects foreign-born students, faculty, and staff. 
I had a long conversation the other day with two Iranian graduate students talking about their situation given the travel ban. We really need more proactive campus policies and they have been, to put it mildly, long in coming. But Thanks. folks, folks in here who've been doing this work can help me out in the Q and A by saying, by you know, I don't think I gave a very comprehensive. I could go on, believe me. <laughs> All right. Well, here's a here's a very practical question here for you guys. So, for current immigrants seeking a change of status, do panel members have any advice or know of resources available to assist in the process? I mean, in general, there are private immigration attorneys, which is what, you know, in the past, some people might have been able to do it on their own. Because things are so fraught right now, and because they're so dangerous, and because a small mistake can blow up in people's faces, we are strongly encouraging people to go to a private immigration attorney. I know Catholic Charities Legal Services for Immigrants provides free immigration services I'm not, they have limited capacity and I don't know exactly which cases they are or aren't taking, but they're the best in terms of free legal services. There's um, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, AILA.org, has a search feature where you can search for immigration attorneys in Wisconsin. And you can Google around, there are a couple other parts of the state where there are some nonprofit services, but unfortunately, some of these are for, I mean, people may have to pay for the services, which I know is tough for people, and which in the current environment, I think is really critical. To tell you just how, um, just to tell you how, how fraught this is these days, even refugees with permanent legal status with that concrete pathway to citizenship um, are having issues with green card and um, citizenship applications. Right now there's a 12 to 18 month delay in routine processing. The good news is that the backlog has been caused by so many people um, noting the fear and going to get their um, legal status cemented through these processes. So that, that's a good thing. Bad thing is that it has overwhelmed USCIS so much that they've had, I've heard that they had to hire 70 new processors in Chicago alone. So that also is kind of good news. But we've also seen um, differences in the way USCIS officers are interviewing people. Uh, there, you know, some are very gracious and very, um, very polite and very courteous, still very tough, which is fine. But then we see people that are incredibly picky, like having an elderly person write a sentence and asking them specifically what that word means. I mean, that, that's just above and beyond what we think is, is normal processing. So, you know, there's some good things about it, but there's some bad. But um, going up with Karen is saying is that uh, Catholic Charities Legal Immigration Service is extremely competent, excellent work. Also, James Place in Milwaukee, which is part of the uh, Brook Consortium of churches, they often, they also provide things. But uh, please do not help people fill stuff out. There's a lot of volunteers that are filling paperwork out. And in this day, with what's going on, that paperwork should only be done by DOJ accredited people or immigration attorneys. It's critically important. Um, I also wanted to plug that um, Voces de la Frontera also does um, free legal clinics on Saturday mornings from 9 a.m. to 11. Um, it's usually just the start of the process. Folks come in on a first come, first serve, walk in basis, um, and we have attorneys who may not necessarily be able to, you know, represent them through the entire process, but can at least get them started um, and refer them to an attorney who can, at a low cost or you know, regular cost, uh, get them through that process. Um, so we highly recommend that, even if it's just to ask questions on like how to get started or you know, questions on your own uh, situation, we do offer that. Um, we also have citizenship classes, as mentioned before, and um, English classes for folks who want to learn English. So, um, but it is, you know, as people have mentioned, kind of a multi-pronged process. You know, we can do as much as possible to help these individuals, but at the end of the day, it comes down to making sure that our elected officials are passing proper legislation that makes the path towards, you know, citizenship far easier than it currently is right now. 
Uh, I think we'll just take some questions directly if people want to raise their hands. Um, I think we, we have a few minutes we can do that. Yeah, in the front here. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, I did think there was a. Did everyone hear that? No. Okay. Um, what Chris said is uh, he was talking about the Young People's Resistance Committee, who has been really leading us in terms of the, the fight for sanctuary campus, and that um, he or I or Maya there, you guys like wave, are happy to give you more information. They meet Mondays at 7 in this very building. Really effective student organization. Uh, I think I saw a hand way in the. There's one there. Yeah. We hear in the political ads about criminal undocumented people. Is there any evidence that you're aware of on the criminality among people who are in this country but not documented? So I had a debate in a class of several years ago about this very question. and. Um, it was like, should we have open borders or should we close the borders? It was kind of stupid, but we had a, we had a good time with it. And so the, the close the borders team found this study, and, and they won. They found the study that said 75% of undocumented immigrants are rapists and they're coming for you. And we were all like, oh my God, close the border. And me, like, I'm totally open borders. No, you know, I was like, yeah, close the border. I felt, well, so I did a little work on that study. <clears throat> so the study was done by a one person, an institute that turned out to be one person who had a PhD from an online for-profit university. And she lived in Atlanta, close to where CNN is. And she did this study based on a group of already incarcerated 12 undocumented immigrants. So all of her numbers came from that, but, and this is rhetoric, right, that it caught like wildfire, because it's what people already think. Like the criminalizing immigrant stuff goes back to the 1930s, if not before then. Right, that immigrants are in and of themselves criminals. Like what Karen was saying, it's a misdemeanor. It's like a tra I got a traffic ticket today. Take me away, okay? You know, I, a parking ticket. I was downtown. You know, guilty as charged. That's the level of crime it is. But if you talk about all these criminals crossing the border, you create fear. And I just, I mean, it, it's not even a misdemeanor. It's, it isn't. It's a civil violation. It's not the same as a misdemeanor. It's more like. A ticket, just be unlawful presence. So, to the extent it's used for that, it's obviously ridiculous. And I know I'm not the the data expert, but I, there have also been studies that show that actually immigrant communities commit crimes at lower rates than native communities because you've got people who are trying really hard and they want to be here. They're not coming to commit crimes; they're coming because they want to build their lives here. So it totally makes sense. And so it's not true is the short answer. Uh, we got time for one or two more. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'd, uh, I'd like to know the panel's comments on, on the DACA program. Why uh, is it uh, even exist? Because all it uh, does, it, it was an executive order that was passed by uh, uh, bypassing Congress and uh, President Obama said he didn't even have the authority to, uh, to do it, and then he changed his mind. Well, I, I mean, it's currently tied up in court. I, I think there's, I, there's a very strong argument that he did have the authority to do it, and certainly there's an extremely strong argument that once it existed the way it was terminated um, was clearly improper. Be again, being terminated not through the procedures that one uses normally to terminate a program, like for good reasons, but for blatantly political reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The new governor in Wisconsin, I'm wondering if the panelists uh, would like to suggest what's going to happen with in-state tuition for dreamers. Talk a little bit about that. Um, 
So we are certainly far more optimistic with the new governor than we were under um, Scott Walker, who was just very blatantly never, I mean, one, removed in state tuition for undocumented uh, students and was, you know, just never going to restore it. So we're certainly optimistic, um, especially because the Evers Barnes campaign, you know, kind of ran as with part of that as their platform. Um, but the reality is, uh, if we want to temper our hopes a little bit, is that the Wisconsin state legislature overall did not turn as we expected. Um, Voces de la Frontera Action endorsed many candidates who were running on pro-immigrant platforms, but unfortunately because of the way things are districted and just simply because of the strong um, Republican stronghold in many non-urban areas, um, it is still a Republican majority legislature. And so just with the way that you know laws are made and such, because we have a Democratic pro-immigrant governor-elect does not mean that these laws are automatically in effect. It's still going to be a process. Um, and so what that means for you know allies of undocumented you know citizens, or even just undocumented students, is that we have to put pressure on our elected officials. We have to, if we were unable to, you know, vote in the people that were going to do this for us, we have to change, you know, hearts and minds and make them realize why this is an economic benefit, if you know that's what's going to convince them to the state of Wisconsin. Um, so it's certainly a long fight ahead of us, but we have a very small sliver of hope, at least. Uh, we, we could probably fit in one more question, so way in the back there. I think you've had your hand up for a while. Well, that's really the kind of thing that I do all the time is go out into areas where um, literally there are some uh, very rural areas where they bring a police presence when I show up because I'm scary. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, we need to, a lot of these places, they literally have never seen a Muslim. They have never seen a black person. They have, um, they live in their little bubble and um, they talk to people that think like them and, uh, and uh, I think it really is our responsibility to find ways to, to go and, and to talk to these groups of people. Um, to find, you know, whatever initiatives, whether go hang out at their coffee shops in some rural area, just decide to go spend a weekend, uh, you know, somewhere. Um, I, I recently was uh, speaking at a school district and um, the reason that I was uh, brought to speak there was because there was such an attitude that the administration was really concerned that the students were going to be um, you know um, leaving school with, with with such a xenophobic attitude and um, some of the staff had the attitude <clears throat> And so I asked for a few questions in advance so that I could, you know, kind of get an idea of what they wanted. And so these were the questions, some of the questions that I got from the staff, which means teachers. These are teachers that are teaching the kids. Um, you know, uh, how, how are we supposed to, if we get a Muslim student here, um, how should we deal with them considering that women are considered as property in your religion? You know, it's like, <laughs> so I thought, you know, I guess the Me Too movement didn't hit, hit, uh, <laughs> hit this person. Um, but anyhow, um, you know, so you're going in with people that, and I think this is the message that I want to get across. Most people are not intentionally um, hateful. They're just ignorant. Honestly, they're just ignorant. Um, you know, I, I've, I've gone to places where 
I'm clearly the only person there, you know, and they'll say, so does your husband allow you to drive? And I'll say, my Harley's outside. <laughs> you know, it, it, you just have to, you, you have to kind of talk to these people. Literally, you're dealing with people that, um, that haven't, had to, haven't had to think out of the box. Um, but, but I can tell you that there are many, there are many that once you really engage them and continue to engage them, there was a group of three women that, that were so um, antagonistic when I went to speak at, 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 in a particular you know, kind of town. But they were so taken and realized how much they didn't know that literally for probably six months, they followed me to a number of places where I was going to speak. Um, so, so there is hope. I just think that we are so polarized. Um, you know, we just, I'm not hanging out with you, heck no, you know what I mean? But the thing is, I think we have to make the effort to try to do that. And, and for students, you know, social media is an equalizer. You know, rather than what happens a lot of times with social media is like insults start flying. But you know what? If you're nice, it's hard for people to, to be nasty because then everybody else sort of attacks them. So, so believe me, I think social media is one of those ways that you can also reach people. Um, Janana's really brave. <laughs> yeah. um, I also want to say, I think that this work is important. It's why I'm an educator. But there's a new book by a guy named St Steve Phillips that's a, um, called Brown is the New White that says, statistically, with people of color and radical white folks, we can win elections. You know, so like, I think that work is important and I respect it and I do it. But I also think we can be who we are and organize with our clear allies, organize um, across coalitions of black, brown, progressive whites. And um, I think that's what we saw in this election. I think I knew the night, I didn't know, but I had a good feeling that when, um, on election night, when they said, you know, uh, Walker has not done as well on, on Waukesha as, present, as in past years because most of us have been working in Waukesha. And I was like, there's the Latino vote in, in the most Republican county in the country, not the state, in the country. Just saying. I think all of us on this panel are always looking for opportunities to get in front of audiences that aren't necessarily people that are champions of our work. And Janan uh, put it really well about you know when she's going around and talking to people, if you're only with people that agree with your point of view, we also don't have the opportunity to know what's out there for us to address. In December of 2016, I had to go to a northwestern Wisconsin city that was preparing to receive a large group of refugees that they did not want. I went up there, I met with the mayor and the hospitals and the schools, and the mayor was uh, anti-refugee. He did not want the people here. And, but the school district and the medical facilities were all very welcoming. Um, to make a long story short, I was invited uh, by the mayor to go to a meeting at a pizza hut. I, I've never thought of that the same since. Um, <laughs> There were 75 people there, and I used to work in mental health before I joined the refugee program. So I always looked for the exits because I worked, I worked with aggressive people you know, that were having rough days. So you know, it's just in my best interest to know how to exit gracefully, fast. And um, the mayor said, if you're gonna go, I'm gonna go with you for your safety. The church that invited me up said, we do not recommend that you go. But a Lutheran minister also said, you know what, I'm gonna go with you. If the mayor's gonna go with you, so will I. And I entered the beast of the belly. I could, or the belly of the beast. I could not believe how mean these people were and evil and ill-informed. And I said, where do you get your facts? What do you read? What do you watch? Oh, we don't. We, no, no. I said, well, where are you getting your information from? And they said, Breitbart. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm in trouble. So, but there were two people, the two leaders of the group actually came up to me after and said, do you mind if we call you and ask you questions? And that relationship has persisted until, until today, that they call me and they'll ask me questions. Out of that very uh, spirited meeting, two major people who are in a position to ask questions that they can take it, the answers to 
um, are still in contact with me, and I think that's incredibly important. In March of this year, I received a phone call from the area newspaper that wanted my reaction to something, and they said, were you aware that this group uh, is now considered a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center? Wow. So um, I've seen it face to face. I'm sure all of you up here have seen it as well, but we welcome those opportunities to come face to face because that also is incredibly important. Well, this is so interesting. I hate to cut this off. I feel like the bad guy up here, but uh, we are officially out of time for the formal part of the program tonight. Uh, we do have a lot of refreshments in the back, and I hope that you guys will be able to stick around for a while and uh, continue the conversation informally. Uh, so thanks for coming, everyone, and thanks again to our presenters for a great program tonight. Thank you.